Somebody tell me what the mission is of the Buffalo Public Schools. Come on. I don't know if you change it. It does. <laughs> and, and then now everybody, what you're going to see before, um, well, let me do this. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me officially do this. So, okay. I haven't done this part. So, um, I, I got to hit with it. Out. There you go. I, I, uh, oh, did we good either way? Yep. Okay, so two things. First of all, um, uh, let me officially call the district parent coordinating council meeting to order. We have a quarter. We officially want to call it to order. Let me bring up um, officially um, our parliamentarian who is going to open us up with our mission statement. Let me tell everybody that um, we are back to the top quality videotaping that we once had at DPCC. Yes. And so, <laughs> so we are. Um, we have sound now. So we remember the old days where we used to have to talk into the mic so we could have good sound for the television. We don't want a bad product for the people who can't be here. We want the people who can't be here to be able to hear and understand what we're talking about. So when you talk, I'm going to be bringing you this mic so you can speak in the mic and people can hear you talking. So we're going to start off by having our parliamentarian, Miss Mary Dugan. Duggan. I say Dugan. So you say Dugan, I say Duggan. This <laughs> is just tomato, tomato. 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 Right. I got you. All right, let's give a hand for Ms. Mary. She's got to get us started. This one and that one? Yeah. Wow. Of the Buffalo Public Schools. Can somebody tell me what that is? Hey. I'll have you say that again so that everybody can hear. You know, just the mic. Just say and just talk into it. We have to see you. Just so they can hear it. Putting children and family first to achieve high academic achievement for all. Sure. There we go. We got it. I'll take one word. Okay. And then. The District Parent Coordinating Council has three primary purposes. Does anybody remember what they are since we're in a new school year? Okay, then I will just, I'll do them this time. We'll see how we can get as the year moves on. The first one is to ensure that a partnership is created with the Buffalo Public Schools. The second is to monitor and report on the implementation of the Buffalo Board of Education's parent involvement policy. And the third is to build capacity for parent involvement to improve student achievement. And with that, I will give it back to Sam. Thank you. Give a hand for Ms. Mary. All right. DPCC, why do we go over that? Why do we start the meeting? Um, first, let me do this. How many people, at, just to make sure, I don't see any, but, but just to double check. How many people are at the DPCC meeting for the first time? Raise your hand. Oh, okay. That's just Riverside. Riverside, what school? School 82. Excellent. What other school back here for the first time? Somebody here, raise a hand. What school? City Honors. All right, good. Well, welcome to have you. All right, so if you're a DPCC rep and you're not um, at the table, please come to the table. All right, it's important to be at the table. All right, so for those people, we got a couple new people, so we want to make sure that we crystal clear about why we start off the way we start off. What is the reason why we start off by going over the mission of Buffalo Public Schools first? And don't everybody answer at the same time. You know where we're going. Yeah, see, thank you, Ms. Lisa. Here, here's the point. Everybody, and for the new people especially, it's very easy to get into a meeting when you have this many parents, you have this many schools represented, and talk about everything but what you're here to talk about. We want to keep our conversation very focused. The mission of Buffalo Public Schools is putting children and families first to ensure a high academic achievement for all. We want to make sure all of our conversation is about how we function as parent partners to achieve that mission. So we're not here to talk about everything, but we're here to talk about our role. What's our specific role? What's the second thing we talked about? 
The second thing we just talked about one minute ago. <laughs> I'm going to wait. <laughs> so after we go over the mission for Buffalo Public School, what do we go over? The mission for DPCC. The reason why we specifically created what we created to do and how we do it. So our main function is to be a partner with Buffalo Public Schools to ensure that there's a partnership. Because Buffalo Public Schools is not Buffalo Public Schools by itself. It's Buffalo Public Schools in partnership with parents, teachers, administrators, board members, the community. We are the parent partner. And we want to make sure that things we talk about tonight are fulfill our responsibility for parent partnership. So being real clear about where we're going and what our mission is, that's how we want to we want to keep stay on that track for the whole night. All right? So the next thing we want to do is, oh, see, Mrs. Gray is not here. Wow, that's probably the first time in two years I haven't seen Miss Gray. She's not right. Anybody heard from Miss Gray? Oh, okay. Oh. All right. Well, we miss Miss Gray. Okay. Um, so, um, can somebody please? Uh, what we like to do is. Um, we acknowledge that one of the, the work that we do here as parents is very difficult. It's not easy. Um, and so what we like to do is get started by acknowledging the presence of God or our divinity. And we like to open in prayer so that we have some divine intervention in our efforts to do right by our children. Um, because this ain't an easy job. I see a pastor in the house over there. Is that Pastor Earl over there? Pastor Earl, why don't you come up here and open us up in prayer if you don't mind. Let's give a hand for Pastor Earl Williams as he comes up. <laughs> what school uh, would you represent? Uh, 69. School 69. Hopkins Catholic. Yeah, that's right. All right. Yeah. 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 Can we all just stand? Yes, you are. Thank you, Father. We bless you right now for this day and this hour and this opportunity. We do pray, God, that as we acknowledge you in all thy ways, that you will direct our path. Now, Father, we ask that you be in the center of this meeting tonight. We pray, God, that everything that's being said and done will be given honor and glory unto you. We thank you right now for our will. We pray for wisdom, understanding, and direction. We will be careful to give you glory, careful to give you honor, and give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you again, uh, Pastor Williams. Uh, my executive committee, right, well, you can hold on a second. My executive committee is very clear, clearly reminds me that we have a diverse um, uh, parent body uh, in that um, we have more than just Christians in the room, but we have Muslims and we have uh, people who are of other faiths. So if anybody of any other faith um, want to pray or um, ask for guidance under that, um, in the name of that divinity, we are, the floor is open to you now. All right, so thank you again, Pastor Williams, for putting us under the protection of the divinity. Um, the next thing we want to do is, normally Mrs. Gray leads us in a pledge. Um, do we have, can, we, can one of the children, which one of the children know the Pledge of Allegiance? Oh, come on. You, I like the way you raise your hand. Come up here real quick. Yeah, there you go. Oh, I got two. That's even better. All right. Come on, gentlemen. All right. The mic is yours. All right. All right. So everybody, please stand and join us for the pledge. First of all, tell me your, come up to the mic and tell me your name and what school you go to. Okay. My school is 93. All right. Come on up, young man. Tell me your school and your name and what school you go to. Jackson, I go to school number 67. All right, gentlemen, y'all, right. Let's give a hand for Kenneth and Roman. All right, let's come over right over to the mic and y'all lead us in the pledge. All right, here we go. The flag, flag is over there. Go ahead, start us off. I pledge gentlemen all right excellent good deal all right having done the pledge 
Wonderful. Uh-oh. See, they said Miss Gray might have lost her job. I ain't, I ain't gonna say that. We don't say that while she ain't around. Okay. All right. So great job, children. Um, so the next thing, for those who haven't been to a DPCC meeting before, uh, the next thing we do is agenda consideration. Um, can one of our DPCC reps tell us what agenda consideration is and why we do it? What is agenda consideration? That's right, because the, the, me, the executive committee, we put the agenda together, um, but we are all members of the district parent co coordinating council. We all have a right to contribute to the agenda. And so in the event that you think it's something important that needs to be discussed tonight, that can't wait for us to consider an executive committee, so you all have an agenda before you, the floor is open for you to consider your pressing issue, if you have a pressing issue that you think needs to be discussed tonight, the floor is open for agenda consideration. Yes? Well, uh, um, I have a problem with um, kids not make, being forced, not necessarily forced, but not wearing their seatbelts on the buses and them getting up and moving around. Okay, so let's do this. The buses, while the buses are moving. All right, so let's do this. Let's go under... Um, uh, well, here's what we can do. We, we, I, I mean, this used to be a normal thing. I, I, it used to be a time where we used to see district administrators, all of them, you'll see a lot of the time. Now, we fortunate tonight. We have everybody from chief academic officer to uh, see at least two of the chiefs of school, but not chiefs of school leadership, that's not the title anymore, is it? What's the new title? The associates and superintendents. Um, I see, but I see a lot of district administrators, so we probably can get that question answered, um, or at least know that the people who know are in the room. So what we'll do is we'll put that under um, the district reports and see if we can get through. So raise that question in the district reports. So on your agenda, everybody, add under district reports question about seatbelts on the bus. Use for seatbelts on the bus. Gender consideration open. Go on once. Over here. All right. With the issue of the meeting that you had with the uh, president of the board, I okay. want to go on record and say a few words to them. You want to speak about the meeting we had with the president of the board? Yes. Okay. Well, you can bring that up under your committee report. As long as I'm able to speak, sir. Okay. No problem. All right. So agenda consideration going twice. Agenda consideration gone. So everybody, now this is the agenda for tonight's meeting. It's officially the agenda for the night's meeting. So having gone through um, all the agenda uh, issues, what we've decided to do at, um, at our meeting last month is that generally what happens is the announcements that we do at the end of the meeting, everybody's all gone. You know what I'm saying? There's only a couple people here and nobody hear the announcements. So somebody recommended when we did our plus delta at the end of the meeting that as a way to make sure people get very important information before the meetings that go late, um, and people are not able to stay, <laughs> we do the announcements first. So, any school got a, any event coming up, any district-related uh, event, anything going on under announcements, all right? So, I got one, any other announcements? Two, all right, three, all right. So, stand over here, uh, four, five, okay, go on. Let's give a hand for Miss Vicki, who's gonna share with us her announcement. Yeah, this is a little easier for shorter people. Is it working? Here like that, but we need to, well, you know, actually, she don't need this when she's speaking out of that, does she? No. Oh, good. You're right. Well, anyway, um, I'm going to be giving some paperwork back up. I'm Vicki Ross. I do peaceful conflict resolution for the Western New York Peace Center and the Interfaith Peace Network. And in a number of the schools, um, and with the schools, and with you all. So anyway, one of the things that we've been working hard on is stopping school push out and it so happens that it's national week against school push out i don't think anybody's in for school push out but it's really about looking at what it is and also what we can do differently and i'm going to say that restorative justice is heavily um represented in the events of the week so we're we're about you know half, almost halfway through the week um tomorrow there is a a uh, rally in front of, um, of, of performing arts, Buffalo Academy of Visual and Performing Arts there on East Ferry and Maston. That'll be at five o'clock. Um, and I'll just 
send these around so people can have a look at it. School push out, of course, if, if, in case you haven't heard that particular term, is uh, when through suspensions or other means, uh, struggling students are discouraged from staying in school. So serving the, you know, not serving the needs of those struggling <coughs> students, but rather just sort of uh, pushing them or, or encouraging them out the door. Did we call that by another name before? Well, it's also, actually last year, this was the school, the week against school to prison pipeline. Okay, gotcha. So that, it's just, well, actually, and yesterday we had a very interesting event on school push out and militarism, <laughs> how those, are, those uh, issues are connected as well. I would start. Okay. Talk about that. Uh, that's a, we'll uh, to be continued. But in the meanwhile, I, I know that uh, Jessica also was going to announce uh, if you want to speak about the, the Thursday's event or Sam. Yeah. Well, she, she already it's all it. part of this this week again. We'll push out. So if you want to pass things around for anybody who didn't didn't get it. Um, so we have one event that's specific to restorative justice in the schools that um, DPCC and the Community Health Worker Network is co-sponsoring with the Erie County Restorative Justice Coalition. Um, and it's going to be a free lunch on Thursday, October 9th at 12 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. at Peace of the City, which is at 301 14th Street. And uh, Brother Sam here is going to be uh, facilitating that conversation along with Andy Prinzen from the Restorative Justice Coalition. So if you're interested in this as an issue or how to implement restorative justice in your school, um, it is in the Code of Conduct that was passed last year. Come out on Thursday at lunchtime and you can learn more about that and I'll pass a flyer out for this. So I have one more announcement. Um, also, some of you may have heard the district is considering being uh, making condoms accessible in the school-based health centers um, and it, it won't be without review um, and so it's really important if you have interest in advising on a condom accessibility program there's going to be community forums and they, they want to have a parent group that's advising on the process um, again this won't be without counseling and education it won't be you know, just handing out condoms in the school. It'll be an integrated, comprehensive program with extremely high rates of teen pregnancy and um, sexually transmitted infections. And so looking at this as a public health intervention to make sure that our children are staying safe. So I'm gonna pass around the sign-in sheet here. If there's also um, other people that are parents in the audience, that would be great. Um, but this is specifically to parents to advise the district on a condom accessibility program. So I'll pass that around. Thank you. It's nice to announce our um, 2014 Buffalo um, annual public meeting. Um, this is in regards to the prisoners being released into our communities under conditions. Um, a lot of our youth have been incarcerated over petty crimes and we're looking to have this rally at Elam, uh, which is scheduled for Thursday, November the 6th at 7 p.m. And I have these commitment cards for those that will commit to coming out and having a voice in the lives of our youth who they are incarcerated for extended period of times and seem to be doing what damage they're doing. And I feel we all can be impacted by our kids going into prisons where they can't get out at a reasonable amount of time. So we're looking to try at least have 25 prisoners released that can help out within our Buffalo schools and be able to release more conditions of work, uh, community services, um, probation, or other alternatives besides incarceration. So once again, this is going to be held at um, Elon Thursday, November 6th at 7 p.m. I do encourage you to sign some of these cards and give it back to me so we can have commitments for those that are showing. Amen? Thank you. This Saturday um, starts, I think everyone got the, the Buffalo Urban Music Project flyer. Hopefully you got one of those. Uh, the program starts up again this Saturday. My kids participated last year. And it's a really nice, fun program. It's at Buffalo State on Saturday mornings from 10 to noon. Um, when the season, when they ended in May, they got to do a little concert at the Bidwell Farmers Market. So it's, it's just a lot of fun for the kids to celebrate music for a couple hours every week. So I encourage, just from my own experience, um, getting children in grades four through eighth grade involved. Uh, they're expanding a little bit. I don't know what this is going to mean, but I know they're involved in community music 
the program also. So they're asking for a registration fee of $20 a semester. It does say there's scholarships available. I know the program, so please, 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 uh, there should be no reason for money to stand in the way. They want kids. So if for some reason you know families that would benefit but don't have the money, still encourage them to bring their kids. Um, it, it really is it's a very nice program. Lastly, um, it's also anti-bullying month. So uh, bullying stops here. There was a big kickoff for, at the Central Public Library. And I just wanted to mention it because there's a, as a resource, there's a whole list of uh, events about stopping bullying. There's also a big uh, flyer banner that is in some of the schools that kids can sign. But anyway, there's a list of the events and there's also a list of resources. So if you go to the, um, to the Buffalo uh, Public Library website, you can download these. Not laugh. All right. Not really no, this is for TV. Okay, uh, you don't need it for that. <laughs> you don't need it for that either. Okay. Only thing I was gonna say, <clears throat> excuse me, School 53 is having our open house Thursday from five to seven. But I just want to piggyback on what Vicky was saying. I would be in the pen room trying to get people to come out and let's start get a push on this restorative justice and let them enact this code, change of the code of conduct that we all done worked on because it's not being implemented. And they, they, this is there, it's for them to use. Just so for some reason, the administrators, a lot of administrators is not trying to do it. 53, we gonna try to implement it. We trying, we already got a teacher to stand up to do everything, but we need the people. I'm not just talking about 53, this is for the district. This is something that's going on because there's something systematic going on around here. And when, when time it happened, everybody gonna be like, oh, I forgot TV. Well, oh, what's the name? What done happened? Something strange is getting ready to happen around here. So all you people that think it's not because we saw everybody looking at charter schools, charter schools, charter schools. But when they close them, when they when they close the public schools, when the kid get thrown out of charter school, where are you going? He's going to jail. So it's time for us to stand up and just start realizing what's going on around here right now. Because school 53, we get the charter school rejects. But them teachers say, we don't care who you said, we gonna teach you. But, the, we, but there's something systematic that's going on that people need to wake up and realize about this. So I'm not, I don't be the head of nothing, but somebody got to get this ball to roll. So if you feel free to come out anytime, come to School 53, come to the parent room, we're going to sit down, listen to some music, and we're going to talk. But this is something that we got to get stopped right now. Because this systematic wants to stop, because if you don't stop it now, it's coming. Trust me, it's coming. Day you know, it's coming. Oh, open house October is Thursday. What's that? October. I'm retired. I don't know nothing about that. <laughs> you know, you October 9th. <laughs> Thursday, October 9th from 5 to 7. But I will be in there pushing this restorative justice and changing the code of conduct. All right. Thank, you. thank you for bringing it up, Vicky, and reminding me. All right, Doc. Um, I would like to everybody acknowledge that Mrs. Gray is in the building. <laughs> so, how many years consecutive it continues to go on? She is here. You know My apologies. South Park High School is also having their open house this Thursday from 5:30 to 7:30. If you're interested in sending your child there in the upcoming school year or you just want to see what's going on in our 100-year-old school, let us stop by and get a dish of ice cream. Thanks. All right. OK, before we get into our agenda, I want to acknowledge um, that in order to make this partnership work um, as a uh, district parent coordinating council, obviously our primary partners um, at the district level is going to be the superintendent and the central administration. And we have a number of essential administrators who have joined us tonight. So I want to give them an opportunity uh, to share anything they want to share. Let me acknowledge the presence of the new chief academic officer, Mrs. Simmons, if you want to stand so people know who you are, new chief, chief academic officer. Let's give Mr. Simmons, Mr. Simmons a hand. You want to see what you words in on this one? Okay, what do you think? All right, I also want to acknowledge the presence of our seeing Dr. Mauricio, associate superintendent. Let's give a hand for Dr. Mauricio. <laughs> Mrs. Cassandra Wright, you know what I'm saying? The Associate Superintendent, Mrs. Cassandra Wright. Let's give Mrs. Cassandra Wright. You know, all of you know, I've seen Dr. Mary Paul. Let's give a hand for Dr. Mary Paul. Um, I see Dr. Frazier from, huh? Oh, I didn't 
a secret. Okay, good. Um, so, okay, but from, I, I'm going to come back. All right, so um, from the Office of Registration, let's give a uh, hand for Dr. Frazier. They have told me that Mrs. Burady has showed up since there you go, Miss Peggy Rady. This is her hand, Miss Peggy Rady. Um, we have, um, who else? Who are any other central administrators? I know Keith is coming up to speak. Who else? You know what? All the central administrators, especially once a stand up, please stand up. Everybody stand up. I don't want to miss nobody. You know what I'm saying? Please stand up. Everybody who I didn't say, say, say your name. Everybody, everybody say your name. Anybody who I didn't say your name. Yes, Mr. Hughes, supervisor. Yes, Ms. Hughes. Yes, is that good? You ain't gonna say your title is one? Okay, she said, okay. All right. Um, and we also are very honored when we have principals in our midst, um, or assistant principals. So, all principals and assistant principals who are here, please stand up. Uh oh. Uh oh. See, look, if you got the floor to yourself, how can you introduce yourself to everybody? You know, do the wonderful work you're doing over at Marva. Marva Jane Daniel. Preparatory school number 37. Yes. <laughs> Any other principals or district wide staff who are here? All right. Thank you. We appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, at this point in our agenda, um, we have minutes from our last meeting. Everybody should have received a copy of the minutes um, in your folder. Um, if you would like, uh, take a second to review the minutes from the last meeting. They were so aptly and wonderfully done by uh, recording secretary, Mr. Veer Muhammad. Um, can I get a motion to pass the minutes from the last meeting? We have a motion from school 53 to pass the minutes. Um, is there a second to the motion? It's been seconded by MST. Is there any question, discussions, changes, amendments to the minutes? No changes to the minutes. Uh, the motion is to pass the minutes as it is. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Hearing none. Motion carries. All right. So uh, we will jump right into our um, a, our agenda for the day. We will start off with our district-wide presentations. We are very fortunate to bring forward um, the director of the Office of Parent and Family Engagement, who is doing an outstanding job partnering with us to do the stuff that we need to do to get the year started. Let's give a big round of applause for Mr. Heath Frisch uh, in the Office of Parent and Family Engagement. We, 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 we record for TV now, so if you if, if so, if so if you stay behind here, you cool. But if you leave, you gotta take the mic. Okay. All right. All right. Well, good evening, folks. Good evening, guys. Second month of the year. I'm glad to see so many folks here. I think we have a little bit more than we had last time, so we're absolutely on the way up. Um, I'm gonna go over a couple quick things because I know we have a, a very full agenda this evening. Uh, very, very important information to make sure that parents get, so I'll speak quickly and uh, swiftly. Um, first thing I want to talk about is the success that we've had so far very early in the year, and it's thanks to so many folks around this room in getting parent involvement plans from the school levels down to City Hall or down to the Parent Center. Uh, we had a deadline of October 3rd, which is normally a standing deadline year over year, and we have well over half of the schools that have submitted their plans so far. So even though we're now a little bit past October 3rd, we kind of threw that date out there knowing that we have a couple days leeway. So I want to thank all of you around this table who encouraged the schools to get their plans together. I know schools are doing a great job of encouraging parents and ensuring that parents are involved in the planning of their parent involvement stuff. So if you have an issue in that regard in the school, please grab me, let me know. We'll make sure that we come out and sit with you and the administrator uh, and make sure that everybody's on the same page. So very excited about that. One of the things that we'll get from that uh, from the initial group of folks that have submitted those plans are a monthly calendar of events for every school and I'm hoping at the next EPCC meeting that we'll have one that looks at the next several months down the road so everybody knows around the table what schools are doing what activities and so on and so forth. So I thank you very much for that. Um, the second item I want to talk about is you will, uh, the parent facilitators that are around the table um, and in the room. Um, I'm very happy to say that you're going to receive a uh, a fairly large box or several boxes of stuff. And I'd like to recognize two uh, very hardworking young ladies that are on the table here. Uh, Ms. Dorothy Gray and Ms. Adrienne Glenn, I owe you a very good thank you. Um, what we did towards the end of last year was we identified the needs that folks around this table and around this room said that they had, which was to get stuff in that parent room. 
So what we did on the Office of Parent Engagement with GPCC Executive Committee was we ordered a ton of stuff related to various topics educationally based. So for example, you're going to get brochures, pamphlets, flyers, and all sorts of information that you can stock your parent room with that parents can come in and take, you can get them out to parents and so on. Topics range from what, what, uh, what developmental stage your child is in and where should they be, about transition from middle school to high school, transition from elementary to middle school, what is my child supposed to be learning in ELA, what is my child supposed to be learning in mathematics, uh, a lot of support for uh, English language learners in that package of stuff as well. So Ms. Gray and Ms. Glenn came, uh, it was just earlier this week if I'm correct, right? Yeah, uh, and they really worked very, very hard to uh, take things apart and to put things together to make these specific school packages. So you'll get two or three boxes that are full of stuff. Um, and I'm using that word stuff just to, so not to go into detail on every single thing that's in there. But um, when you get it, it'll say, to the attention of parent facilitator at school so-and-so. Take, take those items, bring them into your parent room. Uh, we'll talk about more needs for those parent rooms, but I think it's a great start to have things in there that parents can really use. They can bring home, they can help their children with it when they're at home and so on. So I thank the two ladies, but you'll be receiving those things. We start our first delivery. I believe the truck's gonna come up and pick up most of that stuff tomorrow or Friday. So by early next week, you should be getting those packages. If you don't get something, please call Gwen or myself or Judy, let us know, and we'll find out where it is because every school around the room, every school in the district, will be getting a fair amount of supplies for that parent room. Um, Um, I'm going to go off camera, but I'll use my teacher. Take the mic. Take the mic. Let you go. Okay. Thank you. You, you ain't got to work off camera. Okay. Okay. So what I'm giving right now is something called a biennial review. Um, it's a document that we've been trying to get completed for a short while now. Uh, we made a, a version that seemed a little more friendly as far as terminology. So I'm going to go through this with us all now. I'm going to ask that you uh, fill out the document as I'm speaking, and I'm going to collect them so that we can tally the results. And the results talk to how has the district and how has the school engaged parents in school-based decision-making, educational issues that affect children and so on. So we'll go through each box and again, we'll do this with respect to time. Uh, but it's a very critical document because what will happen is the results will be reported up to New York State. And we'll also talk about it with a group that is called the District uh, Committee of Stakeholders. That is the group that puts together the school-based planning and shared decision-making policy for the district. So once it looks like everyone has one, I'll ask that you uh, go ahead. And I apologize. We've got some new copiers down in my office, and they're copying on a different side of the page. So it might be hard to manipulate, but uh, at least the content is there. So everyone have one? No. Okay. There it comes. While we got that break in the, um, break in the, while people waiting for it, um, the Parent Involvement Policy Committee um, has started meeting. Um, and so those people who want to be involved in the development of the policy, and this is really where your know, parents are empowered at when we develop policy, you know, saying about how we engage parents. That policy meeting, um, the next meeting will take place on Monday, October 20th at 6 p.m. Because we want to put together a, a permanent committee, not an a, a ad hoc committee of people who are working with it, you know, after this month, we're going to solidify the committee. So if you want to be on the committee, this is going around as well. So anybody got any questions about the parent environment policy? That's the policy 3170 in your document, in your, your DPCC binder. And that policy is going to get updated by the board. So it's a committee of people that's reviewing it. So if you want to be on that committee or you're interested, take this. This is this, this coming around. Just sign your name on it. And you can and we meet Wednesday, no, Monday, October 20th, 6 o'clock at WNED is the next meeting. Okay, does everybody have a copy of the biennial review? Okay. All right, so we're gonna take a look at where it says part two, statement of success. It should be the front page with the graph on it or the matrix on it. So the first question that I'm gonna ask for you to consider and to check mark the appropriate box is, oh, sure, I'm sorry. Everyone around this table is a member of their SBMT meeting, uh, SBMT team. So the first question is, did your SPMT last year focus on the following school improvement and educational issues? And did they use consensus to design a plan to address them? So as you sat at your SPMT, did you number one, focus on things like student achievement, student support, parent involvement, and budget and resource allocation? And if you did, 
did you use consensus to design a plan to uh, address those items? And if they did not address it, then please check A. If they addressed it but it was inconsistent, please check B. If they it was minimally addressed, please check C. And then moderate and consistent would be D and E. So if you could just give a little check mark in that box, I'll move on to uh, question number two in a moment. Any questions on that one, by the way? Okay. Question number two. On, the, on your SPMT, at the minimum, were the mandated members of that team involved in the shared decision-making process? Uh, principals, thanks to the Office of School Leadership, the principals were just given some additional guidance on how to choose those parent members, right? And there should be five members of, uh, five parent members on that SPMT. One of them is the DPCC representative, one of them is the uh, parent organization leader, one of them is the parent facilitator, and then two additional parents chosen by that parent group. So were parents represented at that table? Were, was at the minimum one school administrator? And were five teachers included in that team? And again, the same criteria follows. Was it implemented consistently, which would be letter E, moderately, minimally, inconsistently, or not at all? And this is great information right, for us to take back to see how and what we need to do a little bit better. But I think we are getting there. Right, any questions on that section number two? Okay. Last one, uh, I'm sorry, next one. When we look at the ways in which we evaluate student improvement or student achievement, we're scores from, and I'll go through the list, we're scores from the attached list of assessment or academic measure, you, measures used to evaluate school level student achievement. And your SBMT should, when they look at the student achievement piece, they should be looking at various grade levels and the examinations or assessments that are decked against those grade levels. And on that third page, which is Appendix A, it talks about those various examinations. So if when your SBMT gathered together and had those mandated members and addressed issues such as school improvement things like parent involvement, budget resource allocation, and so on, when they were looking at determining the assessment of educational performance of students, did they use those assessment measures that you're aware of? And if they did, again, very similar to the others, right? If they did and it was consistent, please mark box E. If, they, if it was done at the SBMT in a moderate fashion, please mark D and then down the list from there. Any questions on that one? Okay. The next one is cut off at the bottom, but it does roll to the next page. So when we talk about the accountability for decisions, was each SBMT member held accountable for the successful implementation and for the functioning of the team as a whole? Right? And I know that everyone around this room last year, because of so many familiar faces, everybody around this table should have participated in, in I'm hoping, two training for SBMT members. One of them by Mr. Hargrave, who we're urging to come back again this year and do it. Uh, and then we had one at the district level where it involved the entire SBMT team. But were they functioning together? Was consensus used? Were, were norms put together where it said we're going to respect everybody at the table and everybody's opinion counts and so on? And if you find that that was done consistently, please mark letter E, minimally, towards letter B or A and so on. <coughs> Any questions on that one? Okay, last two. Uh, the next one, when we're looking at an SBMT and we're looking at when we have disputes or the dispute resolution process, when a dispute or a stalemate arose at the SBMT, were you able to resolve it at the school level? Right, I know consensus sometimes is a difficult thing because we do have to sometimes give in when, to consensus or we have to agree to disagree. Uh, but that's part of decision making and part of effective and successful decision making. So the question is that if the stalemate arose at that table, were you able to resolve it there or did it have to escalate to other areas of the district? Questions on that one? Okay. And then the last one, uh, when we look at state and federal programs and the requirements for parent involvement, everyone around this table knows, at least from when I've been on board, uh, that we talk about Section 1118, right, NCLB, No Child Left Behind, Parent Involvement. We talk about 100.11, shared decision making, right? Those are the pieces that we talk about when we look at this biennial review, when we look at SBMT and shared decision making. And were the, were the protocols as indicated in 1118 followed when coordinating parent involvement initiatives? So for example, were parents involved at the table, right? Were, were parents part of that decision making body when plans were developed? When decisions were made regarding Title I dollars? Were parents involved from the beginning? 
or decisions made in conjunction with parents and other members of the SBMT, but were those protocols as indicated by 1118, and I know many of us went through that training last year with, uh, with Gwen and myself on 1118 and parent involvement. So if it was done minimally, please check the appropriate box and then up through uh, consistent. <laughs> You do not need to mark your name on that document, but uh, I do encourage you, please, 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 to fill out every box. Uh, it's very important that we get that information so we can build a plan for shared decision making going forward, or continue to build upon a plan that was very well developed by, uh, I think, Dr. Frazier several years ago. Questions on any of those? Okay, I was going to talk about the Parent Involvement Committee and the oh. Parent Involvement Meeting, but Mr. Radford took my thunder. Um, does anyone have any questions for me or my office? I, I realize as many of you know I can sit up here and talk about a whole bunch of things for the rest of the evening, but I know we have some other folks. Does anyone have questions, concerns, or issues they want to raise? Anyone? Yes, I know. Hold on, hold on. I did. That's, what I said, yes. That's okay. All right, boyfriend. I'd like to know when I'll be able to access to the computer. Yeah, okay, great question. So, <laughs> great question, and I know that there are a couple other folks. And that's going on I need to know about, is it? <laughs> right. Got some real heated emails lately uh, about access to the computer, and uh, I'm working with it. We are working with the technology department. The issue that's encountered, which I'll share with you, and how we're going to overcome that is number one, there was a specific gentleman over the last couple of years that built the passwords and IDs for the parent facilitators. He is no longer with the district. So I don't believe that function was transferred over to anybody, but I am working with Mr. Bill Russo, who's one of the directors out of Information Technology. He was here a couple weeks ago at the parent orientation, and he is now, he's got somebody there who's gonna to start to build those. We had some real serious trouble over the summer. Um, an email just went out again today to Mr. Russo asking where we are, because we're in October, and I need folks, we need folks to have access to the PCs in the school. So I, I've urged him for an update as to where we are. I should have some information by tomorrow or Friday the latest. But once you get that info, once you get that password and ID, we'll call everyone individually, let them know that you're all set and good to go. <laughs> yes. I hope you hope the camera. I know I did. <laughs> all right, two more questions, and we gonna have to move our agenda, everybody. So we are gonna have school 18 and school 93. Then we gonna have to move the agenda, everybody. Okay. What happens when you have parents that want to get on the internet? Like, if we have it, um, like for the parent portal, mm -hmm. how are we gonna do that? How do you? How do we do that? So we're stuck, we're stuck in the sense right now that there should be a password, a, a guest ID and a guest password, and that's one of the other items that we're working with the technology department on now. I don't know why they don't, and one of the recommendations I made was that we should build these without an expiry date, because it seems like some systems default when you build a password and ID, it defaults to a 12 month period and it cuts you off, and I think that's some of the challenge that we've had. Uh, but we are working on that piece as well. Please be patient, there are teachers in the building, there are administrators, there are other folks that could get you access to a PC. Um, it's touchy because they would log in under their name and their password, but if they were there, they could work with you. So there are some resources in the building. So let me just make sure. Let me just make sure. Say that again. There's only, they're only allowed to log on to two computers and then it logs them off. So at this point, let me make sure I'm understanding. So no school in the district has in the parent room where parents have access to the computer or internet as of right now? As of right now, I believe we're struggling for the parent facilitators to get their password and ID, which is what they could potentially use, and then also to rebuild that guest ID. All right, and we don't have a, we don't have a precise date, a projected date with that. No, I, I know that Mr. Russo is working on it, and I will have an update for the group by Friday. All right. My, one of the first goals was to, to get parent facilitators onboarded and attend the orientations, and now we will get that second piece together. All right, school 93. Yeah, can we? Can you just email it to our emails Absolutely. that we have on the list? Absolutely. Instead of a sure. call. Yep. Sure. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Uh, you, you, is that is that last question from him? Oh. Last question. Are you collecting these? Oh yeah. Let me just say something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and this is important, everybody. Thanks a lot. Let's give a hand for Mr. Heath Frisch. Great job. Um, everybody, that paper you fill now is very, very important. Yeah. Uh, but it's very important that everybody. All the parents who participate in the school-based management team, fill it out, fill it out accurately. Because this issue of evaluation that we talk about at the end of every year, this is you know, obviously something that should have been done already, but we need to have accurate, accurate information about from the people who are actually participating on the school-based management team. So please, everybody, make sure that gets filled out. All right. Um, 
Dr. Williams, you didn't say anything, but don't try to disregard the thing going on to the school. Oh, so you're going to talk about it under your report. I got it. All right. Okay, good. Well, let's do that now. Let's just, well, yeah. Yeah. Is it going to be Dr. Frazier? Yeah, okay. One more, one more item real quick. So I'm, I'm handing out one more copy for everybody of the Parent Guide to Student Success. We ordered about 10,000 copies that are coming into the Parent Center by tomorrow afternoon. This will also be one of those items that comes next week. We, you will have enough to give out roughly enough to give out to every parent in your school. If you need more copies, let us know, but you will get hundreds of these in your school as well to hand out to parents. And uh, I have the esteemed privilege and honor of introducing Dr. Mark Frazier from Central Registration, and Dr. Tyler Williams as well. opportunity to be here to uh, address updates from Central Registration Center. Uh, tonight I'm coming to you because I really need your help in getting the word out um, about where we are in the cycle of Central Registration Center. We just have completed placing and registering over 12,000 students in the last 13 months in Central Registration Center. That means that of our 34,000 students in the district, over 12,000 students have returned to us or, or are brand new. So there's been a very large influx of students into the district in the last 13 months. We've just finished placing all of those students. We no sooner catch our breath and it's time for us to start all over again. As of yesterday, October 6, 2014, we started the application process again. So the new application for elementary, 2015-2016 and high schools 2015-2016 is now available and being passed out right now um, by our great helpers here with the blue and yellow border on the left hand side I gave you several copies of the um, of important information that you need uh, to help me and those of us at Central Registration to get the word out. So please post these in your school. They've gone out in a variety of forms. Um, I'm not seeing them everywhere yet. We, we're getting out as many as we possibly can. So with the new applications that are out for next year, please remember that at Central Registration, we are always in the present day receiving applications for those students who want to attend school today or tomorrow but we are also a year ahead. So in our minds, we're always working on today and we're working 11 months from now for our students that will enter your doors as brand new students or transfer students in September 2015. So who should make an application? This flyer tells you that all new students who would like to attend the Buffalo Public School should submit an application between this window that is open October 6th through December 5th, 2014, for 2015. All current Buffalo Public School students who are interested in transferring to another Buffalo Public School should submit an application now, between now and December 5th. Also, any new or current students interested in testing for criteria-based schools should submit an application. Doctor, first, can I ask you a question about that? Yes. Um, you know, just being aware of the resolution agreement that the district signed, um, and just, I, I want to make sure we cover people here. So, uh, being aware of the resolution um, uh, agreement that the district signed, um, where they're supposed to be looking at the testing process or the criteria based schools, in the event that, uh, I know in that resolution agreement it says that um, the district may have to put a new process in place for September 2015. Right. And then that in March, the, the consultant comes back and says, we got to change the process. How is that going to affect people who have already gone through this testing process? We will stay at our, on our established timeline for notification. Uh, we will follow the same timeline as last year, which I believe we uh, beat any record that we ever had for notification to parents. Mm -hmm. We've taken central registration from being a really peak-oriented uh, department where we had very, very intense peak months to 
of trying to flatten that. So after we receive these applications, we want to notify you of your transfer or of your brand new acceptance as soon as possible. So we will start to have you in as early as uh, February to complete the process with us. So that, that is a 12 month process rather than a three month process. So if changes are made, we will adjust and make any changes that are recommended to us and endorsed by the Board of Education throughout the process and the recommendations that will come from the Office of Civil Rights. So being just as specific as I can, a person gets accepted, say I get accepted at City Island in February, and then the Office of Civil Rights and the Board says that we have to change the process in March. What happens in April? Do, I, do, do we got to start the process all over? It's a new process? Or are people automatically, once they get acceptance this year, they have to be allowed to go for next year? We are operating now under current um, operating procedures endorsed uh, by our current Board of Education, um, and we're moving forward with that. If we are given a change, as you know at Central Registration, a lot happens. Um, schools are open. Yes, they are. No, they're not. Yes, they are. No, they're not. Schools are merged. Yes, they are. No, they're not. Uh, charter schools. Are they closing? Are they staying open? Are we taking those students in? So a lot has happened even in the last year. Are we accepting ninth grades at certain students or at certain schools? Uh, so we always adjust with the changes, no matter what those changes are. So at this point, you're saying central administration will adjust, but you don't know what you will adjust based on whatever the board is saying. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, Thank we, you. We will have to. We will have to follow the recommendations uh, that come out of the Office of Civil Rights findings. So right now, this is our, our procedures. This is these are our timelines. We will notify you. Once we receive those applications, process those applications, uh, we are putting into, um, we've listened to your uh, voices for the last year of those things that you liked about central registration and those things that you wanted to see improvements in. And we are looking to make uh, several changes in our notification process um, with all of you and putting quality control measures uh, on a daily basis to improve our services uh, to all of you. So how do you get an application? You get an application by uh, coming in person to Central Registration Center at 33 Ash Street. Or you can go to the uh, Buffalo Public School website and this flyer tells you where to go. At this point in time, uh, it is under Spotlight and there are links to both applications and to this flyer. So it's very easy to find. It's on the, it's on the cover of the, it's on the front page of the district's website. So between now and December 5th, how do you submit that application? You can drop it off at Central Registration Center, you can mail it, or you can fax it to us anytime between now and December 5th. Right now we have, uh, we're engaging in a, uh, a high school ahead process, uh, and we're making plans um, to have parents make very informed decisions. I'll talk about that in just a moment. Also, I, uh, I uh, handed out for you all of the testing and open house dates, which are well underway. Our, many of our schools announced tonight uh, that they have open houses for uh, parents that are interested and students that are interested in attending. Uh, those dates have been distributed to you. Please know about uh, testing. You, all you have to do is show up for the testing on the testing date. Because as parents, you are still making decisions about your choices and in what order you're going to put them on the application. So you don't have to submit an application in order to show up for testing. But between October 6th and December 5th, you absolutely have to submit an application if you're interested in a transfer or you are a new student. So for Frederick Law Olmsted 156, and City Honors, and Buffalo Academy for Visual and Performing Arts at the elementary level, all you have to do is show up. The only exception to that is Frederick Law Olmsted School 64, where you will be scheduled for an appointment. Because students are individually tested on those dates. So it's not a, it's not a group test. So you will be given, once you submit the application, in order for you to go for testing at Frederick Law Olmsted, you must submit the application. The application must be on file in order for you to get an appointment. The only way to get an appointment is to submit an application. So 
for high schools, all you have to do is show up for all of them. Buffalo Academy for Visual and Performing Arts, City Honors, Olmsted, and Hutchinson Central Technical High School. Just show up, get your application in by December 5th. The application this year has been revised. Many, many scores of people uh, looked at the application through a variety of lenses. Um, the last test was to give it to two people who were completely unaware uh, and unfamiliar with the application process, who were parents who looked at this for the first time with a fresh set of eyes to give us final feedback on, do you understand when you read this, is this understandable to you as a parent? So that was our last test. So the applications were finished um, Sunday afternoon, printed and ready on the counter and on the website posted as of Monday. While we were revising the application and planning for this year, we started to talk about, about and reconvene a lot of different uh, offices and community <coughs> partners um, to have our students who are current eighth grade students make very well-informed decisions about their ninth grade choice. So once again this year, we are going to be hosting um, a, high, a high school showcase, a high school jamboree, and this year, former counselor, no, principal extraordinaire, Margaret J. Daniel, <laughs> preparatory school number 37, is Dr. Tanja Williams, and she's gonna be joining me right now um, to talk about this fantastic event that we have planned for our current sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, but really, really, really focusing and urging on all current eighth graders to attend. It's never too early to start thinking about high school, so we want those sixth graders there, we want the seventh graders there, but we insist on our eighth graders being there on Saturday, October 18th at School 37. So I would like Dr. Williams to talk uh, briefly about the high school jamboree at School 37. Thank you so much, Dr. Frazier. Thank you, Mr. Radford and this esteemed group for allowing me time to share very briefly with you a little bit about the high school jamboree. I am so excited about this event because I can remember as a parent of a child in eighth grade, there were so many decisions that you have to make. You're thinking about things like, where is the school? What programs are offered at the school? What is the criteria to get accepted into the school? All of these things can cause a little bit of stress, and we want to take the stress out of all of the selection process for you. And so the district decided to sponsor an event where you could come on one Saturday and get lots of information on all of the different high schools and programs that we have within the Buffalo Public Schools. And so on October 18th at School 37, 295 Carlton Street, which is right off of Main Street, you will be able to come, you will be able to meet with high school counselors, they will have tables set up with information on the different programs that their schools offer. You will be able to go into workshops and hear from counselors what the specific criteria is for different schools, and you will be able to receive technical assistance on completing the application. So we're hoping that when you leave on October 18th from School 37, everything is pretty much completed. So I look forward to seeing all of you. I'm told that last year there were over 900 parents, so this year, you know, we want to double that. So, so we want the word out, please. Um, I ask that you take the flyers to your churches, community centers, um, any organizations that you may be involved with, and please share, because this is an event, although it is at School 37, it is open to all parents in the city of Buffalo. Thank you. Nine o'clock until one o'clock. And it's a family affair, so even if you have younger children, feel free to bring them also. All right, that's the best kind. All right, all right, thank you. All right, let's give them another hand for Dr. Frazier and Dr. Tommy Williams. We appreciate it. All right, um, moving right along on our agenda. First thing I want to do is um, I want to. I mean, 
Sister Severe told me that Tracy did what she always do. She took good care of us. Did Tracy, how was dinner tonight, everybody? All right, Tracy, thank you so much for taking good care of us. You know, we don't ever take you for granted. We appreciate you so much, so thank you, Tracy. Also, we've been joined by um, Ms. Reynolds. Are you Dr. Reynolds yet? Are you Dr. Reynolds? Oh, but I know you're on the path to Dr. Reynolds, but we've been joined by the principal of School 39, MLK. Let's give a hand for Ms. Ramona Reynolds. Um, we want to, for the parents here, um, we, we know that for those people who got the message and those who are DPCC members, we know that we, we said there was going to be child care tonight, so we want to apologize again. We don't know what happened with child care, but we will find out what happened with child care tonight. Um, we, and we know we also talked about homework help that's normally here, so we want to apologize um, and we will try to find out what happened um, with the child care and the homework help. Um, but is there anybody who had a, a specific need for child care? Um, because we do have um, somebody that's willing to help out if somebody has a specific need. Um, so if you do, just come up and let us know. All right, so um, moving on along with our agenda, is there somebody here for Say Yes? I know um, the Say Yes, our, our rep, Ms. Nadia Moore, who's normally here, um, is not doing well, so nobody else is here from Say Yes. Okay, so we're gonna go jump right into our agenda. Last month, you know that the issue that came up um, was the issue with after school. Um, there was a lot of questions about after school and it was not clear and we had a back and forth discussion about it and so we decided we didn't have enough information to, and so many different people have so many different kinds of information. We decided to just stop, make a motion um, and we passed unanimous motion asking the district if they can come give us a comprehensive explanation about what's going on with after school um, and we were able to uh, talk to the superintendent and both the board president and true to his word, he has uh, staff members here tonight to answer our questions on the after school and to do a presentation. So uh, without any further ado, let me bring before us the chief academic officer, Mrs. Simmons, um, for, and her staff uh, to talk about after school. Let's give her a hand as she comes forward. Hi everyone, I'm not Mrs. Simmons, I'm Mary Polly. Uh, Mrs. Simmons, of course, is here with us tonight. And you'll be receiving a spreadsheet, and I'll take you through what's on that spreadsheet. In, in, does everybody have one? Not yet? Okay, I won't go too fast then. What we're going to show you on this spreadsheet are different ways, uh, different schools and different programs that will be operating after school at all of the different sites. On the sheet you'll also see how we're paying for these programs after school. It might be a grant, a 21st century grant. It might be a school improvement grant. Sometimes you'll hear us call those SIG grants. S-I-G stands for School Improvement Grant. And we have Title I as another funding source. And then there's uh, some information on our partners. So if, at the building sites, if there is a partner, that's also listed for you. And then there's a column that will show you the grade levels that are served at the building. And you'll have a projected start date and end date. And it will also show you the days of the week that the program will run and the hours per day. Mrs. Ferguson. Oh, I'm sorry. And that, that shows you the school's status, whether it's a priority school, a focus school, and if there's nothing listed, it's a school in good standing. You're welcome. We also have someone here from Title I and someone here from our School Improvement Grant Office who can answer any questions, if you have any questions. You'll notice that we have some staggered start dates and that was intentional. Uh, we, we wanted to be sure that we got the school year started and we were firmly underway in our buildings. And we've, um, we've taken a look at all of the, the, the possible funding sources to provide allocations for all of the buildings that you see on this list. And we're letting the schools determine 
how the schools will plan the, plan their own programs <laughs> in situations where we don't have a partner with the school. And we will give the, the guidance to the schools to have part of the program academic and part of the program enrichment. Mrs. Ferguson. Well, they figured out how many weeks they wanted the program to run, and based on the amount of money that was available to have the program going the number of days per week that they wanted to run the program, that's what it would figure out to be. That, that's how much money they would have to operate the program. Does that make sense? Yeah, can I ask a follow-up question to that? Because I know um, a couple years ago uh, when Dr. Brown first came, one of the things that was presented to the DPCC was that we were going to come up with a standardized uh, after-school program where every school would have a, the similar kind of program was going to be what they call a Cadillac program. How does this line up with that? Well, you'll see that there are a lot of partner organizations. We call them our CBOs, community-based organizations that are our partners. And a lot of those are funded by the 21st Century Grants. And they have more uh, autonomy kind of all over their programs after school. So we provided them with some guidance, just like actually we used the model that Dr. Brown had started out with, um, advising the buildings to use half of their time for academics and half of their time for enrichment. So it is an academically based program, but we want students to learn through participation and engaging activities because we all know that you don't have to have a, a paper and pencil in your hand to be learning. So we want to also encourage organizations that come up with activities that make learning fun for kids too. But you didn't answer the question. I tried. Um, well, I guess what I'm saying is that this looks like a, a bunch of different types of programs. Like for example, what um, Ina was just raising, um, back under the Supplemental Educational Services Program, we had all the programs were essentially five days a week, three hours a day. It looked like somebody, and they all basically went from October to June. Now we got programs that starting in um, October, ending in February, some ending in, in April, some ending in March. You know, so we got all these different types of programs and that's just very different than what we had under SES. It's very different than the last time somebody came and talked to us about after school. It's very different than what we told. So what I'm saying is that, so as the thing that we were told last by the district in terms of a consistent program that was going to be throughout the schools, is that gone now and this is the new model? Or are we still working towards that program that, we do, that was last presented to us um, as a district parent coordinating council? Well, in my estimation, the consistency of the model is the fact that the program is partially academic and partially enrichment. And it will look different at each site because, as everybody knows, each school is different and each school has different needs. In addition to that, each school has a different partner. So if you're partnering with Boys and Girls Club or you're partnering, partnering with Child and Adolescent Treatment Services, the programs that are provided in those buildings will not be exactly the same, but they will be meeting the needs of the students in the building that they operate in. So our goal isn't to do a program that is one size fits all, because we know one size does not fit all. And we want to make sure that buildings are able to put programs in place that meet the needs of their students. And who knows better how to meet the needs of their students? The people that are in those buildings or somebody at central office who's making a plan for everybody that would look the same. So we, we had to keep that in mind when we were looking at the plans because we want to be sure that these programs really do meet the needs of all of the students in all of the buildings and we're listening to the people that are running the programs. Yeah, but Dr. Uh, Pauly, what, what, what was said to us the last time that we got here, and I just want to make sure I'm not misunderstanding, is that is the exact opposite of what you just said. We, we, it was said that um, it was going to be this district-wide initiative would say yes to come up with an after-school program that where, where these different, all these different community-based organizations would go through some kind of vetting process and then they would be able to provide a consistent kind of service that the district was, was going to monitor and make sure it was consistent across programs. Um, and so what I'm asking is, is, is that, that plan that was given to us as what we were moving to for all of our schools two years ago still in effect or 
Or is this the now plan in effect and we're not doing that plan anymore? I think what you're referring to is the say yes model. And um, I guess that's one of the options that's contained within this. But there are a lot of differences between buildings. So when you're saying, when you're referring to what we said before, I think last year, I, this is, you know, I'm ranking on my first year here, a great year. And I think what I saw last year were differences in the buildings, but also some things that were the same within the buildings. So when, oh. you're, when you're talking about making a plan that's consistent across all the buildings, there'll be pieces of those plans that are consistent across the buildings. But if you're saying, you know, is it exactly the same in each building? I guess the answer would be no. And I think it's a good thing that we're saying no, because we really do want to meet the needs of all of the students in the building. And I guess, I mean, if, if there's somebody else that can answer the question, I guess what I want to get clarity of for DPCC purposes is that we, the last time somebody came here and spoke to us, they talked to us about a plan that was going to happen over a three year period where in all the schools we were going to have this quote unquote Cadillac after school program is going to be consistent across all the schools. If we're not, if we're doing it and we're still on that trajectory to get to that, fine. If we're not, we're doing something different, that's fine too. But I just want to understand, are we still on the plan that was told to DPCC or are we on a different plan? And I guess I would have to ask for some clarification on that. Of who told you and who are you referring to? So the district, last time the district came and gave us an after school program, Dr. Mauricio um, was there when we, when we was here when we got the presentation. That's why I'm asking if somebody who was here when they gave us the presentation, when they did the whole say yes rollout, when they did the whole thing where we were going to put together the after school task force or something and we were going to come up with a way to align it. This was the justification for not having SES. The district was going to take over SES. We were going to come up with a standardized form process. So I'm just saying, if, if, are we still doing that? Can somebody answer, are we still doing that or are we doing something different? Okay. I can speak to the 21st century and the student school day grant programs and those particular CBO programs, once they are applied to through the state in close collaboration to the identified buildings that they would like to work in for a specific target group in very close collaboration with the administrator and the parents there, once that application has been approved, it is uh, set in stone with NYSCD. Unless there happens to be a minute program parameter change, which they would have to do an amendment to the state. So in speaking to the 21st century extended school day, that's kind of extrapolated from the additional information here. And with the SES waiver, not from the district, but it was by the state. Right. So I don't know if that'll help you with. Well, I, I guess I guess what it comes down to. I know um, Cassandra here, uh, Wright was there. I know. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to get to is, you know, uh, just a simple answer to the question of the last plan that was presented to DPCC. Are we doing that plan, or are we doing something different? I think the uh, the answer for that right now is that there are conversations that are existing with the superintendent to say yes and other partners. Um, I do recall uh, where they met partners and they actually worked for Exactly. Uh, Thank and, you. And that was something that happened last year. We started exactly. our program and they started their program in December or January. So uh, what I would say is more to come. Uh, we don't have a solid yes or a solid no. The superintendent is having that conversation. All right. So at this point, this is what we're moving forward on. But the, the other plan that we were originally given, we don't know if it's moving forward or not. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Yes, uh, my question deals with the amount of Title I funds that will actually go to the after school program. Um, I sat on the Title I committee previously, and I noticed a lot of our funding wasn't really going to the, the youth uh, for, for programs that would help them after school, such as mentoring and things like that. And the, the monies were going, let's just say, to places that uh, uh, Congressman Higgins was going to take an active look at to make sure things were straightened out. So my question to you is, the programs you're doing now, will that Title I funding be primarily used to help these kids or would it be like fattening someone else's pocket is what I'm trying to say. In other words, you're putting the money toward the, the adults and, and the administrators as opposed to the children. That's my question. Title I. The Title I funding for the after school programs will pay all of the costs that are associated with that. So it will pay teachers, 
and it'll pay for materials and, and different things that they need to run the program, the extended learning time program. Okay, so any other questions, we, we want to make they, sure they're specific to after school. We not, it, that's what the questions, do. that's what we're talking about right now. All right, go. Okay, I have two. One, you had mentioned that our form would say where the funding sources are, but the form does not say where the funding sources are that we received. And I don't know if it's because you have a larger size sheet and if it got cut off on ours, um, but we don't have it. Okay. The funding sources, there are a variety of funding sources, and um, I, we wanted to fit it onto a sheet so that it didn't, so that you could read it, so you probably don't have that in front of you. Um, can we get it next month or something? Well, I can tell you that it, we can give you an update on that. Okay. And then my second question is, I noticed City Honors isn't listed in here, even as the schools. Was that a City Honors decision, or how is it that... that well, City Honors doesn't receive Title I funds because it's not a Title I building. Is that the only one? It is the only one. Okay. And, and Sam, I just want to know how can I get a copy of the breakdown of the Title I funds? In other words, okay, well, well, let's, let, let's bring that under, uh, under when we got Title I. Right now, everybody, we got after school people here talking about after school, and we got other questions that we can have, but we got to talk to the people that we invited about what we talked to them about, and then other issues we got to deal with with other administrators in another context. So we want to keep our focus on uh, after school right now. Uh, um, this might be a, a, a real simple question that you can uh, help me out with. I'm trying to understand the practicality of, as a parent, um, I'm representing City Honors, but as a parent of two students at 64, what does this actually mean to me? If the program is going to be offered from November 5th to April 30th, am I expecting information from my school with regards to what sort of after school programs are going to be offered? Because so far, we've only gotten information with regards to needing parents to volunteer for after school programs that are going to happen for six weeks that won't happen if parents don't volunteer. So I'm trying to reconcile this sheet with the information I've received from my school so far. The information, the specific information on the programs will come from the building principals. So I don't have the down to the details for you tonight, just, <coughs> just really telling you how many days a week and where. So if that doesn't happen, who should we follow up with? If, uh, so each uh, associate, I was going to say chief school leadership, each associate superintendent for that school can, can actually answer that question. I think that's Mrs. Berrini's school, 64? Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, but as a principal, I want you to know that as a principal, we designed a letter that went out to the parents who received a, a template from the district, but all the details, start date, the um, end time, the start time, what programs would be offered, um, the opportunities for involvement from parents, but also uh, whether there'd be a snack involved, whether uh, we had an art, music, or ELA, and all those details were, were indicated from the letter from the principal as we developed them uh, with our school-based management team. And then we sent that out to parents. So that's the letter you should get if you don't certainly speak with this. Okay, story. so we should just be looking for that. Absolutely. Okay. So now, if something's on this paper, is that assuring that it's going to be a program? Because uh, listening to what she's, the, um, the Danielle said is that they said if they don't get enough parent volunteers, it ain't going to be one. So is that... So what you see here is what's going to happen. Okay. Uh, principals haven't been informed of the actual details, so we will be sharing that with them tomorrow. All right. Okay. You said, I'm sorry. You said, you said principals at this point aren't aware of, of this that's happening? Right. So they haven't sent the letter out because we haven't given them the information. Okay. Okay, because I had asked about this and they said, oh no, we're not going to have an after school program, but then I see this, so I just want to make sure that what, it's not a principal choice, it's a district choice. Correct. Okay, thank you. And so there is going to be an after school program at all the schools that are on the here. That's correct. All right. <laughs> okay, now with Southside having a two schedule school and some of our kids get out at 2.15 and some get out at 3.15, and you have only two hours, and we're supposed to go until like quarter to five. So some of them are going to get close to three hours. How is that going to work with Title I? Because our school is the biggest in the district. So uh, Ms. Wright is the chief uh, associate superintendent for that school. So that's a conversation she can have with Mrs. Jesenowski to talk about whether they're going to have stag staggered start and end times or whether buses are going to remain an extra hour for those students. So that's something she can speak with her. Uh, but I mean, are you going to divide those two hours 
an hour for the fifth through eighth grade and an hour for the K through fourth grade? I think the best scenario is for uh, Mrs. Wright to speak with the principal to make a determination on what makes sense at the school, and then that, that will lead to the conversation about what, uh, how many hours will be offered to the school. Hello, I'm Cynthia Marshall. I'm a parent of a student at uh, Olmstead 156 at Kingsington and prior student of School 64. I was wondering what would have to happen in order for chess to be offered as a after-school program district-wide. Who would I see about that? That's an awesome question. So when we designed, when I was principal of Lorraine uh, and also uh, principal of Bennett, so Mrs. Collins here, we met together with our partners. Uh, when we didn't have a partner, we, went, we met together with our site-based management team. And we said, the question was, what do our kids need in order to be successful? And then the second question was, what do we have to do to keep them here, especially at the high school level, uh, where they can walk out at three o'clock. At the elementary level, we had a little bit more control, but we wanted to know what keeps them here, what makes it enjoyable, and then, and then also, Equally important is what can we do to help them academically? So we wanted it to look a little different from the school day, but, but equally important, we wanted them to have a great time and want to be there and also learn. So uh, what I would say is that if you uh, meet with, uh, and you said, um, oh, Olmstead. If, if the parent facilitator from Olmstead is here, that would be, you are the, no, oh, okay. And, and ma'am, you're the parent facilitator? Oh. So if you work with the parent facilitator. I just, I just want to make one comment. Yep. Uh, last year, he was in 64. Mm -hmm. He was doing chess in 64. He started the first scholastic team in 64. They played at the museum over there off of um, Delaware, what have you. They made history. Okay, now this year he's having a hard time getting back up in there because this school is one of those schools that's not in trouble, so they don't get much funds. So it's a process of what are they going to fund or what have you, but this should be a program that's not just for one school, it should be citywide. And I'm just wanting to know what to do because the, the director of what would be the program is recognized by the Federal Chess Association. So he's a, he's a, a, a tournament director. So I want to know how would he be able to go about getting recognized citywide. So for that, for the gentleman, he could speak with Vanessa Hughes on uh, making this an available offering to all of the schools. We do want to leave school-based decision-making for the parents and for the students. And if they want to do um, a drawing club or photography or swim club, whatever the school wants to do, we want to let them have, have that opportunity to make that happen. So if chess is what they would like to do, certainly that, that's something that they should consider. And then I think getting uh, worth uh, Mrs. Hughes and sending something out saying this is something that we can work with your school on, this gentleman you're speaking about, uh, we can actually uh, provide that to the schools and they can consider that as an option. Okay. All right. Any other questions dist uh, from district uh, as it relates to after school? Okay. You want to, any, anything further from? I just wanted to say that was an, an, an awesome question. What grade are you in? Sit nine. Nine. Freshman. Freshman. Okay. So the one of the things that we did uh, at Bennett, to some success and some uh, in some ways it didn't always work out, and that is when adults try to make up ideas about what uh, freshmen will stay after school for. Uh, a lot of times we miss the mark, and we thought, oh, they would love X or Y or chess or swim or photography. And then when we asked students and said, well, what would you like? They actually came up with the programs they would like, and then they were more likely to stay. So with your charter school, I think if you speak with your student council president, your um, administration at, at, uh, at the school, and say, how about if you get together with uh, the students and ask us what we would like, then we may be more motivated to stay. So I would say for all of our schools, that's probably the best approach. So that was a great question. Thank you for the answer. If I could just make one comment. I mean, I don't know if you have to answer one way or other, but I do want to make the comment um, that um, you know, three or four years ago, we had a, a, S, a SES program that we were told was not aligning with the district and our kids weren't getting academically, you know, prepared to work with the district. And so the district was going to take over that process and offer us something better. Um, what we found since the district has taken over, we have gone from programs that were five days a week, three hours a day to all different kinds of programs. Some programs as short as six weeks. Um, 
and then we were told that we were going to get this wonderful new after school partnership and we were going to get all these things that were going to happen to make after school the best after school program in the country and now it sounds like we got a question mark about whether we're doing that and that kind of oscillation you know the inconsistency that creates for parents you know what I mean uh, whether, where, your, where your child goes for after school is a very important part of how we manage our day you know what I'm saying so if your child got an after school program that you can count on that they go in they start in October and end in June that's one thing but if you got a program that starts in November and ends in February you're gonna find that most parents are not even gonna take advantage of that because why would you you know what I'm saying you got babysitting or your your child care already taken care of for the school year why would you disrupt that for a six-week program so whoever's making the decisions to be not clear this not they're not thinking about it in a parent friendly way I mean we'll bring this before the board we'll take a motion after this but I just want to say if, if, if you got any thoughts about why this program is inconsistent like this and it's starting one thing starting another thing then starting something else and if you have any sensitivity of that impact on parents of when that kind of thing happens within the district and that's a great point there are four of us that sit on uh, superintendent's cabinet we'll be sure to uh, share that Thank you. All right, let's give a hand for the Central Administration After School Program um, report. All right, so the next item on the agenda um, is related to the parent complaint form. Y'all got a copy in your folder? Is it in the folder? Is the parent complaint form in the folder? In the, in, in the folder for the DPCC reps. Heath, is that, did we get a copy? Did we get copies of that? The parent complaint form. Did the copies get in the folder for that? No. Okay. No worries. Okay. Okay. No worries. Don't worry about it. Okay. All right. Is what? Okay. Right. Okay. So everybody, here's a very, very important point, point. Um, and we, as an executive committee, um, decided to put this item on the agenda because we get a lot of calls from you about your concerns. And what we've been, and so what we've done is because of specifically what happened in the school 82 situation, we wanted to make sure we know what the exact protocol is for when a parent has a concern. Because obviously you know that as executive committee members, we are all volunteers. You know what I'm saying? And so we get calls every day, all day about crises that are going on in the school. So this is what we want you to do. This is very important for all DPCC reps all PTO presidents, all parent facilitators. Here is the beginning of the formal process for making a complaint. And this is really important when I say formal process. Because if you get upset about something that happened with your child in school that you thought shouldn't have happened, and you go screaming and hollering at the secretary at the school, or screaming and hollering at the assistant principal or the dean of students, what do you think will happen? Yeah, as a matter of fact, instead of talking about your issue, guess what the conversation is going to be about? It's going to be about you and your reaction, all right? So here's what has to happen. We, as parents, have to be a little bit more disciplined, a little bit more organized, and we have to do something that's going to change the situation. So here's what we were told by the State Education Department. In order for, in order for anything to be official or formal, the district is responsible for providing a formal parent complaint process, which they did. As a matter of fact, when we brought this up in the executive committee, Heath went on, uh, Frisch went online and made sure that this form has been updated and more parent friendly, because those of you who did this last year as it relates to the physical education, you know it was a, the form was not clear. There is a parent complaint form online. So if you go onto the website and you go under parents, correct? And you click parents. Yeah. Okay, one of the many resources on that parent webpage is the superintendent complaint form. So if you're at the district's main page and you look across the middle, it has these various um, um, navigation links, and one of them says parents. So if you click on that, it'll bring a little drop down menu, and then you'll click on the Office of Parent Engagement. You click on that, it brings you to this office homepage. I know everyone in this room has seen that page before. So, um, once you're there, if you look to the left, there are these quick links, they call them, and one of them says parent advocate slash superintendent complaint form. And then you'll click on that, and it'll lead you to the link of that document. It's an electronic version, and as President Radford mentioned, we, we had some duplicates and some things. We've cleaned it up. It looks real nice, and uh, it, it's much cleaner now. All right. So the first thing that a parent should do 
is go to the website, fill out the parent complaint form. When you fill out the parent, huh? Yeah, okay, yeah. okay, right. I'll get. To, I'm going to get to that. All right. So go to the website, fill out the parent complaint form. When you click submit, you are going to get a number. Is you're gonna you're gonna get a response. It's gonna it's gonna give you a page you can print out. It's gonna give you a reference number, like a case number. That's your case number. Now the district has a responsibility, and it says to you, we will follow up with you right away. It says that when you click submit, it says they're going to follow up with you, right? That is the beginning of the process, all right? Then, if you don't hear anything, you know what I'm saying, give it a reasonable amount of time. Give it 48, 72 hours if you don't hear anything. Then, now you can go to the Board of Education. That's the responsibility of the superintendent. That's the superintendent complaint form. If he does not respond, then you file, you can send an email directly to the superintendent saying, here's my reference number. I put in a complaint three days ago. I have not heard anything. Okay? If the Board of Education president does not respond to you, then you can go to the state education website and you can go to the Office of Legal Counsel. We're going to give you all this in writing to be in your, in your um, folder. And you can file a formal complaint with the state. Now, why am I saying this? Because in order for us to make the system better, we, our, our issues that we raise, we have to raise with the intention of having a reasonable conversation with somebody about how we address the issue to get a resolution to it. Now, you can't be ignored. Because that's why we got all these district administrators, so you're not ignored. So the first thing is you to know the whole chain of command so you're not ignored. The second thing is knowing what to do if you are ignored or you're not satisfied with the answer. If you're not satisfied with the answer, you have a right to appeal. If you're not satisfied with the superintendent's response, who do you appeal to? No. Who? You appeal to the Board of Education. On the same website as the Board of Education President's um, website, his email address, you send a letter directly to the Board of Education President. All right? That's who you appeal to. You can get on the speaker's list. In everybody's folder, you got a, a, a sheet in there on how to present at the Board of Education. You can get on the speaker's list of the Board of Education. You call 816-3567 any Tuesday before noon on the day before a school board meeting. Like tomorrow, there's a school board meeting. So if you want to get on the agenda, you have to be on the agenda before noon the day before. Or you can just call anytime and be on the next agenda. But you call 816-3567 and you go speak directly to the board if you're not satisfied with what happens at the building level or with the response from the superintendent and his staff. Then you take it to the board. If you're not satisfied at the board level, then what you do is you can go to the state level. These are all things that we'll help you do, right, as a district parent coordinating council. But it's very important that you know the process and you are prepared to follow the process. Here's the next piece of very important information as it relates to the forms, right? It's really important that we get discipline to begin to put our concerns in writing. You have to document what happened, when it happened, you know what I'm saying, and what you want done too. You have to put that in writing. So, for example, in the school aid due situation, we did not get an incident report. As a parent, you have a right to know what happened to your child. Don't let nobody tell you ever that you don't have a right to know what happened to your child. Okay? And people should come and share the information with you. Right? And you also have a right to know what's going to be done to make sure whatever the concern is don't happen again. But if you don't, and you don't have a paper trail to say you asked for it, you know, that's it. You just don't got a paper trail and you just upset and ain't nothing gonna happen. So what we wanna do today, tonight, is make sure that we become really good partners in helping all of us. This is not about a, just a, a, a negative perspective. This is really about the positive side of that. We want Buffalo Public School District to be the best school district in the country. It ain't, gonna get, it ain't gonna be the best unless we help it be the best by what we do with our own children, by our expectations, 
Because if we expect the district not to do the things it's supposed to do, well, then it don't do them. But if we expect them to do it, and then we follow the process that they laid out to make sure they do it, then we have the best chance to make sure it's getting done. So anybody got any questions about the parent complaint process? All right, so it's clear for everybody. Okay, your question about if you don't have a computer. Now, here's the other part of it, right? One, you know, we obviously got to deal with the situation. You should be able to go to any school and go into the parent room and use a computer. That's obviously, as we found out tonight, that that's not the case. I'll bring it up tomorrow at the school board meeting, you know, that there are schools that don't, don't have parent access to the computer, and we're already in the middle of October. That's, I mean, or the beginning of October. That's, the, that's a problem. There are parents who don't even know nothing about a computer and our literacy. Right, and so we also need a higher copy of a report. Is there, is there any access to a higher copy? Um, no, but what we discussed at the executive committee meeting was ensuring that every parent facilitator had copies right. and they would be available in the parent room. All right, so what we will work on is higher copies being available in the parent room at the schools, making sure parent co parents have a copy of that. But here's the important point. If you come across that situation, then that's the ideal time to call us. And what we'll do is we'll address that situation on a case-by-case -case basis. I'm coming to you. But the important thing is everybody empowered to know the process. You don't have to call DPCC executive committee to get that information. That's information that every parent in the district should know and have a right to. So you all know it. Make sure your PTO know it. Make sure the other members of your parent organizations know it. Make sure as when parents come to you, you tell them that. That should be your first advice. Get that reference number because if you call us and you don't have the reference number, that's what we're going to say do. Well, go, go put it, file it officially, then let's talk about what you wrote in your complaint. Right. Right. So the public library is an option, but the school is an option. But we, again, will deal with that on a case by case basis. Right. If you're stonewalled on the forms, you can send a certified letter. Once you have that signature, address it to whoever that form or who's ever in charge at the school. Once they sign for it, it's as good as a form. All right, good deal. All right, any other questions? Comments? All right, no other questions or comments on the parent complaint form. Next item on the agenda, uh, Wendy, DBC Ship Leadership Retreat and Development Plan. Let's give a hand for Dr. Wendy Mistrata. Come on. Are you going to talk in front of the mic or are you going to? Okay. Um, any of us who have been involved in this for a little while, we know the district leadership and the board comes and goes. So we spend a lot of time dealing with that. But we really wanted to find some time for our parent leaders to get together and talk about what our priorities are are the power we have and what agenda we have and how we're going to move forward with that. So we're going to be doing a parent leadership retreat. And uh, I sent out a do a poll thanks to people who replied to that about dates and times that are convenient. And uh, it came out that the majority are, we have a lot of people who are available it seems on Wednesday nights. So we are going to go with that. Um, we're going to do two nights. We're going to do October 22nd and October 29th for our leadership retreat. And there should be, I believe, a sheet in everyone's, um, yeah, parent leadership retreat is in the folders. Um, we've talked, I know Sam has used the metaphor of traveling. Um, if you don't know where you're going, how are you going to know how to get there? So that we're going to stick with that as our vision. We're going to map our success. We're going to figure out what it is that we want to accomplish and how we're going to do it. We're going to do it through this retreat. We're going to have facilitators from the Creative Studies Department of Buffalo State to help us out with this. The only thing we don't have right now is the location because we're trying to find a nice spot for us to enjoy our time together and to, to do this work together. So um, since we don't have the location determined yet, um, I do have a 
sign-up sheet I'm going to pass around for anyone who's interested. So anyone who signs up, you're not committing yourself to attending, but it will make sure that we contact you with information about the location. And information will still go out to all the parent leaders, but this is also a double check, so we'll do a special contact reach out to, to the people who sign up for this. Any questions? So do they have to attend on both nights, or is no. it? It would, we would love it if you could come on both nights. Um, if you can't, still come. You can only come to one of the nights. We still want as many voices of our parent leaders as we can get. Mary. Uh, did I miss your, I thought we were going to do the 15th and the 22nd. It didn't work out. It didn't, okay. <laughs> just, just what I thought those were the days. That was, okay. That's what we were initially looking okay. at. Okay. Look at the time, it's next Wednesday. Right. And uh, right. just, no. <laughs> <laughs> didn't work out. Yes. Um, we do not have a plan to have child care there. Um, we did have a plan it's in the evening, 5.30 to 8.30, and we'll have dinner. But we did not make arrangements to do that. Um, why don't you come up with a way for the, the indicate on your, is it a sign up form? Indicate if you need child care, and if we get enough people who may need it, we may see if we can, what we can do. Yes, that's excellent. So yeah, indicate on there if you want, if you are in need of child care, one. And if you have ideas, is we're still trying to figure out a location, on the back side, just write down ideas too, because we are trying to figure out, um, we're having a lot of trouble finding places available both nights. So if you have any suggestions, places that you'd like to go that you find, Empowering, relaxing, comforting. Um, we're, we want to get out of the schools. We want to get out of the feeling of this and uh, and have a place retreaty. A retreaty place. Okay. <laughs> Do you want me to talk about orientation? Any other questions about leadership retreat? Okay. Um, if I may, I'm going to skip over the asset map survey because I'm also working on the new member orientation. Um, it worked well when we did the full parent orientation before a DPCC meeting. So we're going to stick with that, and we're going to do a new, a new rep orientation before our next meeting in November. And you might notice that it's different because it's on a Monday, November 10th, and that's because the first Tuesday is Election Day and the second Tuesday is Veterans Day. And then we're getting into Thanksgiving, so that's not going to work. So we are meeting Monday, November 10th. And so from 4 to 6, before the DPCC meeting, we are going to have an orientation. And essentially what we're going to do is we're going to go through the binders, because we keep referring to stuff in the binders. So we're going to take some time and actually look at our materials and discuss what our roles and responsibilities are. We're going to talk some about funding. We're going to talk a little bit about Robert's rules. I'm throwing that at Mary now. <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about Robert's rules and running a meeting. So um, we're hoping that all of our members will participate, but especially um, by November, we should have mem um, hopefully representatives from every school and have them connect. And I want to emphasize, I mean, it's, it's new members. We want to make sure all of our new members, Riverside, get the, all the questions you asked earlier, all those questions get answered. But it's open for everybody. So anybody who want to understand more about 3170, 1118, um, 100.11, the things that govern what we do, you know, um, you want to understand more about Robert's Rules of Order, you know, anything to make you a more effective DPCC representative, that's what we're going to be covering. So it's open for anybody who wants to come to the new member orientation. Feel about literacy. You are going still? Yeah. All right, I'm happy to go right to seal of my literacy. Okay, um, people tonight also should have received... Oh, I'm sorry, she said it was a question? I'm sorry. Does that maybe it will be here? Yes, it'll be here. So just come, we'll still have meals, we'll have child care. We'll have all that. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't watch my own notes. <laughs> um, all right, the seal of my literacy pilot uh, there were flyers about this in everyone's folders, and there were some extras out there. Uh, this is actually a really exciting opportunity for us. It's only been law in this state for, for two years now, so we're part of the pilot group in the state is looking at this. And what this is going to mean is any of our students who are proficient in English and another language will get recognized with a special seal on their diploma. So when they graduate, it's going to be a special honor. 
because they are at least bilingual. I say at least because we do have students who speak more than two languages. So this is important to our English-speaking students who are studying new languages, but it's also important to our English language learners who are coming here for whom English is the second language or third. So what they're doing now to start with is a pilot at four of the high schools and they're targeting the 11th and 12th graders. So you can see on the sheet that came out that um, each of the four high schools that are piloted, City Honors, Olmsted, Hutch Tech, and Lafayette, have a liaison that is working with the Department of Multilingual Education to, um, to roll this out. And at each of those schools, they're also going to have an information session, three information sessions, morning and afternoon and an evening. Uh, we just don't have the date yet for Hutch Tech. All the parents of 11th and 12th graders at those four schools are gonna get letters inviting them. I think it's important for us to know because we have other high schools. Now, I was told initially that no student would be turned away. So even if you have a student who is proficient in more than one language that does not attend one of these four high schools, I strongly encourage you to go to one of these information sessions and get more information and begin the process of trying to earn this seal. And there is some learning. It is, it, it's not going to be easy um, for our students to get it. It is some work. But if you get, and if you get any challenge whatsoever because you're not in one of those four schools, please let me know because we want to make sure that every child that does the work gets the credit for it. The basis for how they're going to determine is um, there are four standard prerequisites that all kids have to meet, and they have to be passing all their coursework in all their required examinations from 9th through 11th grade with a 75 or higher, have a GPA of 85 or higher, and get teacher recommendations, two to three teacher recommendations. Then, that's just the basic, and then there's additional requirements based on the languages. Um, so if you come to the information session, and there's a number of ways to do it, so that kids can, can use their strengths to earn the points that they need to earn the seal. So uh, are there any questions about this new program? Yes. Um, it is a committee actually that's coming out of the Department of Multilingual Education. Um, I'm sitting on it as the, the DPC student. Um, but there are principals, assistant principals, guidance counselors, and teachers who right now are on the committee development. What does everything else have to do with What does the grade, you get graded for everything else, and you have to take the math and you have math, you take English and pass English. You don't get credit for math as long as all your English grades are. So with this being something that's an accomplishment for these kids, because they do, it, regardless if our language is the first, second, or third, it's an accomplishment for them. So why are they making it so hard to give them a reward? Well, and I think they're deliberately trying to make it too hard. That's why the, the level is 75%. So oh, it's That's why I'm saying, what, why? I, I will take it back to them. I mean, it, it's, I, I don't know what level you want it to be. You could very well, I don't think, have that level. It was, it's, it's, this, this is not in person. You hear all this no child left behind. These kids are advancing in different areas. The ones that they are advancing in are the ones who try to go down, not even. But that they're getting held down in. This is the way. If, I was, if my child was doing great in Spanish and English, because they're, I mean, sorry, Spanish and Italian, because they are English speaking, you can give them credit for Spanish and Italian. It's going to be on their report card, it's great. They learn second and third language. So why these children, they, they're in our schools, that already come in with a first language, and there is just as difficult for them to learn English as it is for us to learn Spanish or anything else. Why do they have to fight for the same accreditation? It shouldn't be that hard. I, I don't even know why it's really a, a table, you know, something that's even put before. They learned a second language, giving the credit for what, what's okay. the difference? 
So, it's, it's a, so I can make a good point. I don't know if we can resolve it here tonight, but we but but there's a point well taken, and if there's a way to follow it up, if you can meet with Wendy directly to follow it up, right? And if it's an issue we need to bring back to the larger body, let's bring it back to the larger body, okay? So what we want to do now is because it's, it's hours getting late, and I know that um, we got a couple reports. Um, we got a legislative committee report. So um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Janique Curry, and I'm the chair of the Legislative Committee. And we have a couple of priorities um, for this year. And I just want, I didn't make a lot of reports, but I just wanted to talk about what our legislative priorities are going to be for this year in no particular uh, order of priority. Um, so the one thing was physical education, which currently there's some legislation in the Senate and the Assembly. So we're hoping to make sure that we lobby for that and make sure that that um, work that. This is TV, Mike. <laughs> Okay. If you so, want to sign up for the legislative committee. So if you want to sign up for the legislative committee, there's two sheets going around. So our legislative priorities for 2014 and 2015 in no particular order um, are the physical education. There's currently some legislation in the Senate and the Assembly. So we're going to be lobbying our state legislators to make sure that all the work um, that Jessica and the team have done in terms of physical education and making sure that we're meeting the standard for our children, um, particularly those in elementary school, is met. Um, one of the things that we talked about in one of our roundtables, as well as in um, a meeting with the superintendent, is a municipal Wi-Fi uh, for low-income families. We're looking at a partnership with um, Time Warner um, Cable for those who do not have access to the internet. If you have um, a low income, or there's going to be some standards for that, so we're going to be working on that to make sure that everybody has access to internet. So somebody was talking about that. So, um, so we're going to be really lobbying for that, and I believe that um, the the, the, the Common Council Education Committee already meet. Yeah, they they right. met and passed a resolution on that. So we're going to be working on that on a local level, but as well as on a state level. Um, we are also going to be looking at homeschooling um, resources and a designation for students who are homeschooled. There's been a lot of issues coming up, particularly with you know Say Yes and some of the other, just in general, some resources that are available for students in terms of their diplomas and in terms of the resources and books and all the things that are, um, that are required of them to learn. Um, but we want to make sure that they have some of those things. Um, there's also been an issue of athletics um, and the charter schools. And there's charter school students being able to play for some of the Buffalo Public Schools. Um, so it's a title, a Section 6 uh, issue. Um, so we're going to be working on that as well with um, our state legislators. Um, and then there's always issues of English language learners and there's always issues of special education. So those are our priorities. If there are any other priorities that you think need uh, to be legislatively solved, please make sure that you sign up for the committee and um, make me aware of it. I do have some copies of the report. I'll pass it out with my name and my phone number and my email on it. Um, so that's it for legislative committee. Great job. Let's give a hand for Janine Curry, legislator Murray, six to Murray. All right, and the way we wrap up for those people who are new, as um, uh, soon as uh, uh, Murray is done, we are going to um, go around and do our plus delta, and then we're going to close. And that's where our real goal is to get better at what we do every meeting. So we're just going to go around and have you tell us to do what, um, what it is that you would like to see we could do better and what we did that you thought worked well. How you doing? Go to the mic so you can hear me. If you want to know why I'm dressed like this, the yellow that you see is because um, I am also a Buffalo Peacemaker and I am the Executive Director of the Survivors Coalition. Um, the reason why I came to this meeting today is because uh, I think it's very important that um, you know, the peacemakers be in contact with facilitators at schools across the board in Buffalo, New York. Um, if you come on the corner of Brighter and uh, Delavan around 2 o'clock, you can see the work of the peacemakers. So we're on that corner to make sure that the students uh, go home safely, uh, have free passage through the neighborhoods, uh, and we're not paid by anyone. Uh, we do this from the kindness of our hearts. Uh, we do it every day. Uh, I believe that uh, your students, and I'm saying your students, have some issues 
that need teachers and facilitators to come out to school to walk down the street with their kids to see what they're doing and see how they can change their lives. And on that note, I want you to understand something here in Buffalo. When you can see your board on TV fighting and you guys don't go and rally and tell them enough is enough and it's a problem, how can I tell kids to stop fighting when the board is fighting? It sort of looks like, uh, and I don't even watch uh, TV, but the uh, Housewives of Atlanta City or whatever, that's what that board looks like to me. Um, and our kids are paying attention. And I, I know, Sam, that they're going to be calling you because I'm giving them your number now to call you because they have some issues and concerns. And hopefully, uh, in the near future, we will be having them walking on your meetings and you can hear their issues and concerns. Uh, we are saving lives every day on our streets. Um, today, we had a young lady um, had prayer with us. And, you know, on a corner, she grabbed like five other kids and said, let's have prayer. She didn't even know how to pray. But she prayed. And it wasn't about us just forcing it on her. But, you know, she got an understanding that, you know, the work that we do out here on the street is tremendous. So, um, as we, Janique, as you ride, you go to ECMC. And uh, you tell those doctors and those nurses in there that they need to come out. They need to really come out to support this organization that's right here and others. It's time for us to take back our city to right away. We can't keep fighting each other. It's not going to get done like that. And also, yes, sir. I also was part of this program when it first started uh, at East High School. And um, I'm willing to go back for the training to get to where I need to be so I can come on there and let you know about crime and safety. Also, um, uh, Attorney General Hochul's office is doing something to let me read, read it real quick to you guys so you can be a part of that planning. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Rita Turner. I am also a uh, member of the Violence Coalition. And as Murray said, we are willing to be out in the streets, volunteering our time to help stop this and say enough is enough. I am also a parent. My I have two of six children left in the Buffalo Public Schools, and it's it's a task. But um, U.S. Attorney Gen uh, General William Holcomb will be having an Eastside Community Forum next Tuesday at six o'clock at Frederick Homestead, three nineteen Suffolk Street in Buffalo at the Old Kensington High School. Please come and share your concerns about your neighborhood and learn how to, we can safely report information to law enforcement officials. There will, not only will U.S. Attorney Holcomb be there, but there will be um, Buffalo Police Department, FBI, uh, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, explosives, and other enforcement agencies and community partners, as well as Stop the Violence Coalition and Buffalo Peacemakers. Please. Next Tuesday, at six o'clock, and I'm at um, 319, the old Kensington High School on Suffolk. And I do have a couple of flyers that I am giving up. Please come and help us. And please, like he said, say enough is enough. We have to get this this violence decreased. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Let's give a hand for Stop the Violence Coalition and all the good work they do in our community. All right. All right. Um, I know we over. Um, Lisa. Plus them.